Tonight, we're going to be talking about the gospel for marriage and singleness. We're going to look at some practical application for these topics, but first, I want to talk about the marriage. Revelation 19, 6 through 9 says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of many mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Our ultimate hope is not in a husband and wife becoming one flesh, but in being united with Christ, the true bridegroom. But we treat our eternal bridegroom as if he is unworthy and inadequate, and we run off to other lovers time and time again. The Bible uses strong and even offensive language to describe our rebellion against God. The prophets use the term whore whoredom over 60 times. This idea of an unfaithful bride is most understood through the book of Hosea. In Ray Ortland's book, Marriage and the Mystery of the Gospel, he summarizes it in this way. The Lord gave himself to Israel in a pure and holy marriage. He pledged himself to her to be her God for all that that means, and she consented to be his for all that that means. He promised to guide her infallibly, protect her fiercely, fulfill her satisfyingly. She promised to love him, obey him, honor him. But this most sacred marriage failed most miserably. Though the divine husband was faithful, true, and generous, the bride sold out. She gave herself away to many lovers many times, and she was not shy about it. She hurled herself with abandon into her pattern of open and even compulsive whoredom. We don't like to use these ugly words and think of our sin being as as dirty as the public prostitution of a married woman, but this is the reality of our sin. It's ugly, dirty, and unfaithful to a good and perfect pride groom. But praise God that he's able to rekindle a dead romance. Jesus Christ is preparing for himself a pure and spotless bride, the church, who will be united to him as the very body of Christ. Jesus gave his life to make us his own, even in the midst of our infidelity and love affair with sin. All who are believers in Christ are betrothed to him, and he is preparing and sanctifying his bride for the wedding feast of the Lamb when Christ returns and we, his church, his bride, his body, will be holy and blameless and eternally united with him in glory. This has been God's plan from the beginning. We can see a parallel between Genesis and Revelation. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Revelation 21.1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The first heaven and earth were created as the home of the first couple, Adam and Eve, and the new heaven and earth will be created as the eternal home of the son and his bride. Until that day, we will have trials and will be tempted to be an unfaithful bride. But as we wait, our calling is to ready ourselves for the groom and to look forward to the eternal honeymoon that is to come. The Bible is a love story. This is how the topic of marriage is applicable to all of us, no matter what stage of life we are in. Whether we are married or single, we can view all of life in light of the marriage. To do that, we need to recognize that marriage isn't just a human construct that is addressed in the Bible. It is designed by God and is the theme of scripture from Genesis to Revelation. With that said, as the body of Christ, we are called to put the gospel on display in our lives. God has given marriage as a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church, and it is Christ's love for the church that is to be a model for our marriage relationships. This eternal marriage is the focus of scripture. 
but it also offers us both hope and instruction for our marriages today. So think about what marriage looks like in the day-to-day. How does media or the culture portray it? What purpose does marriage serve? Now think about your ideal marriage or the best example of marriage you have seen. Does it match up with what you described before or is it different? What do you think the role of a husband and the role of a wife are? What do those roles mean to you? How does that play out in your life? Genesis 2, 18 through 24 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. The man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. God had just finished creating a beautiful, perfect paradise for Adam. But in the midst of all the good, God found something not good. It was not good for the man to be alone. God takes what is not good, though, and he creates something very good when he makes the woman. God created the woman to be the man's helper. To understand what this means, I think we should look at something that it does not mean. Being a helper cannot imply inferiority because Psalm 54.4 tells us that God himself is our helper. Genesis 1.26 tells us that the man and woman were both created in God's image. So again, being a helper does not indicate that the woman is of lesser value than her husband. But what it does mean is that the woman was intentionally created for the man. She was made to complement him and to complete him. Have you ever paid much attention or given any thought? about why God would parade all the animals in front of Adam before he made the woman. God knew that none of those animals would make a suitable helper, but he wanted Adam to recognize what God already knew. It wasn't good for him to be alone. He needed a helper that was like him, yet distinctly different from him as well. Adam does in fact recognize it, and we can hear almost a sigh of relief in his response when he says, at last, This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Just as marriage is divine and not a human construct, neither is manhood or womanhood or the male head and female helper roles. God made man and woman with distinct characteristics and purposed them for unique roles. If we would stop and look at God's word for guidance, we would find that there's actually a lot of freedom within the roles God designed for us. Instead, we often think that we need to fit into the box of tenacious feminism or oppressive patriarchy. But we shouldn't give up on God's design simply because we misunderstand it or because it doesn't fit into modern societal norms. We have to remember that all aspects of manhood and womanhood and all aspects of marriage and sex and intimacy were not created for this broken world. They were created for a perfect, safe world. When sin entered the world and we were cast out of Eden, God was kind and gracious to not take back his gift of marriage. Because we still get to enjoy this privilege, our marriages can be a reminder of what Eden once was and hope for what is yet to come. Ephesians 5, 22 through 33 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. 
Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loves the church. This kind of love is not self-seeking, but self-sacrificial. It is a love that endures even when sinned against. It is a love that gives its very life for the bride. A husband can only love his bride like Christ loves the church if he takes on the mindset of Christ, that of a humble servant, defender, and protector. The husband has a weighty call of protecting, loving, and leading his wife, not to be her savior, but to point her and the watching world to the true savior who is coming for his bride. Wives are called to submit to their husbands, even as their husbands submit to Christ. This kind of submission imitates the humility of Christ, willingly submitting to God's plan and will for our good and protection. A wife's submission is voluntary and requires an attitude of humility and readiness to yield to and support her husband. God's vision for marriage is not one where a husband uses his strength to dominate his wife as he rules over her, but one in which a husband uses his strength to protect, nurture, and honor his wife. Wives submit to their husband's leadership, knowing that ultimately they are submitting to God who has established this order for marriage. This kind of humility and submission to God's design is a powerful testimony to the beauty and love of the gospel. It's a picture that God may use even to bring unbelievers to himself, including unbelieving husbands. It's important to note that submission to husband should never mean submission to sin. So what are some things a wife should submit to that she may not like but aren't sin? What are things that she should not submit to because they are sin? Are there any gray areas? A husband may ask his wife to do something that she just doesn't want to do, such as move to a new city, attend a particular church, or send their kids to a certain school. And in these things, wives should ultimately submit to the final decision of their husbands. However, wives should not submit to requests from their husbands to sin, such as to watch pornography together, to be dishonest on tax returns, or to cease to worship God. As wives, we are warned against being a nag or quarrelsome from Proverbs 27 15. Rather, we should be refreshing to our husbands. This doesn't mean that we never disagree with our husbands. We are given freedom to express our desires and concerns and to ask questions. We can help our husbands see things from a different point of view. But in the end, we should follow their lead, submitting to our husbands and the role God has given them within our marriages. Just as our individual prayer life and growing our relationship with God allows our hearts to become more in sync with God's heart, communicating with our husbands and pursuing a holy marriage together allows our hearts to become more in sync with each other and with God's. This is how, as wives, we can submit to our husbands without resentment. With that said, there will be times that our husbands let us down. In these times, it's important to remember that we are not joined together as one because an officiant proclaimed it. Even though we made a decision to get married, it's not even out of our own will that we are joined together. A husband and a wife are joined together because God joined them together. When your marriage disappoints you, you are still joined together by God. When your marriage is hard, 
you are still joined together by God. Your imperfect marriage is a picture of grace and it is very important and dear to God. Your marriage has the potential to bring redemption to a broken world. For those who are married, the understanding that our satisfaction and salvation comes from God alone ought to change the way we respond to conflict within marriage. Christ is preparing his bride for himself by sanctifying her, and one way that he sanctifies us is through our human marriages. Too often, we leave a marriage simply because we are unhappy, believing that the goal of marriage is our personal fulfillment. However, God's purpose for marriage is not to make us happy, but to make us holy. When your spouse is not showing you the affection you long for, rather than turn to someone else to fulfill those unmet desires, turn to God who satisfies all your needs. When your spouse sins against you, rather than retaliate in anger or frustration, praise God for the opportunity to be an ambassador of His grace. When your spouse is selfishly seeking their own good over yours, rather than fight for what you think you deserve, seek to outdo your spouse in showing love and honor. So have you ever put your hope in your spouse or placed unrealistic expectations on them to fulfill you? Have you ever made your spouse an idol? Human marriage is a pointer to our marriage to Christ, but the two are not equal. The marriage we experience on this side of eternity is flawed and full of conflict because it is a union between two sinful people. Many of us, whether married or single, make the mistake of elevating our spouse to the position of Savior, believing that we will be truly happy and fulfilled when and only when we find our soulmate. If we look to our imperfect spouse as a source of happiness, we will be horribly disappointed. A spouse cannot save you. Only Jesus can do that. A husband or wife cannot fulfill all your desires. Only God can do that. It is unfair, unprofitable, and idolatrous to put the weight of your happiness on someone who was never meant to fulfill all your needs. For those who are single, this means that you do not have to wait for a spouse but before you can live a life fruitful service to Christ and abundant joy in His love. We've talked a lot about marriage and how it reflects the marriage. So what do you think God thinks about singleness? 1 Corinthians 7, 7, 8 says, I wish that all were as myself, as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. Paul calls singleness a gift. This gift allowed him to fully devote himself to the work of the kingdom without having to leave a wife and her children behind at home. Some people have been given the gift of singleness. This doesn't mean that we can't long for marriage. You may hope to be married and that desire can be healthy, but you are not incomplete in your singleness because you have everything you need in your union with Christ. Just as marriage can be a good gift that reflects Christ in the church, singleness is only as good as what we do with it. For those who do not have the obligations and time constraints that having a family can create, what are you doing with your time? So for as long as God gifts us with singleness, we should enjoy that gift and use it for His glory. This doesn't mean that singleness is easy. We aren't given an exact timeline, but it doesn't seem like much time passed from when God created Adam to when he said, it's not good for man to be alone. Singleness requires another level of self-control as well as community of people who love and care for you. Most of all, it requires a full dependence on Christ, recognizing that singleness is not permanent. Take hope in knowing that the bridegroom is coming for his bride. When you feel lonely, unlovable, or unwanted, rather than turn to an inappropriate or unhealthy relationship, turn to the Lord who promises to never leave you, who loves you so much that he died for you, 
and who calls you his chosen possession. You do not need a spouse. You have Jesus. Whether you are married or single, marriage is a pointer that should direct your gaze and your hope to the marriage supper of the Lamb, when we all, as the body of Christ, will be presented to him as his pure and spotless bride. This marriage is our only one that promises full and complete joy and satisfaction. So I think it would be a disservice to talk about marriage and singleness and not discuss sex. I'm going to keep it short though. Our society has taken this good gift and corrupted it and made it into something it's not. I think society's view of sex is what has caused this topic to be taboo within the church. We don't want to talk about something that seems so perverse. But our bodies, all of our body, is united to Christ. Sexual integrity doesn't come from despising the body, but by honoring it. Yet we blush at certain proverbs or the Song of Solomon and try to say that those verses are really only talking about the marriage between Christ and the church. Proverbs 5, 15 through 19 says, Drink from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be for yourself alone, and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed, and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Listen to that language. I can't believe that these are just allegories. No, they show a beautiful picture of the joy and pleasure that comes from experiencing sex within marriage as God designed it. Again, from Ray Ortland's book, Marriage and the Mystery of the Gospel, he says, The key to understanding the sexual wisdom of Proverbs is to combine both form and freedom, both structure and liberation. Conservative people love form and restraint and control. Progressive people love freedom and openness and choices. Both see part of the truth, but wisdom sees more. Wisdom teaches us that God gave us our sexuality both to focus our romantic joy and to unleash our romantic joy. When our desires are both focused and unleashed, both form and freedom, our sexual experience becomes wonderfully intensified. A marriage can flourish within both form and freedom because sex is like fire. In the fireplace, it keeps us warm. Outside of the fireplace, it burns the house down. This passage in Proverbs 5 is saying, Keep the fire within the marital fireplace and stoke that fire as hot as you can. The Bible's metaphor for sexual satisfaction is the water that can slake a raging thirst. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Man brings into a marriage pent-up sexual desires, passions, and powers. And wisdom is saying, satisfy your thirst through lovemaking with your wife. Wisdom is not saying, you feel desire and there's temptation out there? Then what you need is an iron will. So there's your future. Endless frustration bottled up inside. Self-control is an important part of maturity, but wisdom believes that God's remedy for a man's thirst for sex is sex. Ladies, of all the women in the world, you are the only holy outlet for your husband's sexual desires, and your husband is the only holy outlet for your desires. There's no alternative. I can say to my husband, I don't really care about this football game. I'm going to bed. Likewise, he can tell me, I don't really want to put together 40 Valentines for our kids' classes. Of course, sometimes we do things that we don't like or care about to show our affection for one another. But the point is, for those things, there's an alternative. He can watch the game by himself. He can call or text his brothers or dad or friends about the game. I can do the Valentines by myself. But when it comes to sex, I can't say, I don't really care about this, because the only alternative is sin. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. 
Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Basically, the point I'm trying to make is this. Sex is a good gift. But even good things go bad if we have to disobey God to get them. Married or single, we need to be aware of sexual sin. Sexual sin certainly complicates our relationships, but it violates the marriage. When we are joined to the Lord as one spirit, we belong to Christ. We are married at the deepest level of our being. Our bodies, all of our body, is united to Christ. Therefore, we cannot trivialize our sexual behavior. Paul tells us to flee from sexual immorality. And we have the perfect example of this in Joseph when he literally runs away from Potiphar's wife. It would be foolish to see how close we can get to sexual sin before we actually cross the line. God says, flee. With that said, some of us have crossed the line, but praise God for his forgiveness. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. God does not hate us because of our sexual sin. Our sin does not disqualify us. Rather, when we fall into the arms of our bridegroom, exhausted and guilty, he catches us and offers mercy and grace and makes us pure again. And this is when we can become a compelling voice in favor of God's design for marriage. If you want to know how you're doing with this whole marriage thing, ask other people. Ask your kids or friends to point out ways that your marriage is a model of the gospel. It may be simple things like mommy made daddy's favorite meal, even though she doesn't like it. Or it may be something bigger like you moved across the country for your husband's job or you forgave your husband's betrayal. Next week, we will be talking about the gospel for parenting and discipleship.